The Battle of Rourke's Drift was a battle in the Anglo-Zulu War. Rourke's Drift today is far different to what it was like in 1879. Of the soldiers who survived the battle, three of them are buried in Swansea cemeteries. The defence of the mission station of Rourke's Drift was under the command of Lieutenants John Chard of the Royal Engineers and Gonville Bromhead. It came after the British Army's defeat at the Battle of Isandwala on the 22nd of January 1879. A little over 150 British and colonial troops successfully defended the garrison against an intense assault by three to 4,000 Zulu warriors. The Zulu attack on Rourke's Drift came very close to defeating the small garrison, but were eventually repelled. 11 Victoria Crosses and five Distinguished Conduct Medals were awarded to the defenders. Rourke's Drift, known as Kwa Jimu, Jim's Land in the Zulu language, was a mission station and the former trading post of James Rourke, an Irish merchant. It was located near a drift or ford on the Buffalo Muziathi River, which at the time formed the border between the British colony of Natal and the Zulu Kingdom. On the 9th of January 1879, the British No. 3 Centre Column under Lord Chelmsford arrived and encamped at the drift. On the 11th of January, the day after the British ultimatum to the Zulus expired, the column crossed the river and encamped on the Zulu bank. A small force consisting of B Company, 2nd Battalion, the 24th of Foot, the 2nd Warwickshire Regiment, commanded by Lieutenant Gonville Bromhead, was detailed to garrison the post, which had been turned into a supply depot and hospital under the overall command of Brevet Major Henry Spaulding, 104th Foot, a member of Lord Chelmsford's staff. Um, on the 20th of January, after reconnaissance patrolling and building the track for its wagons, Lord Chelmsford's column March to Islangwana, approximately six miles, or 9.7 kilometres, to the east, leaving behind the small garrison. A large company of the second and third Natal native contingent under Captain William Stevenson was ordered to remain at the post to strengthen the garrison. This company numbered between 100 and 350 men. Captain Thomas Ringforth's G Company of the first 24th foot was ordered to move up from its station at Help Mirka after its own relief arrived to further reinforce the position. Later that evening, a part of number two column under Brevet Colonel Anthony Dumford of the Royal Engineers arrived at the drift and camped on the Zulu bank where it remained through the next day. On the evening of the 21st of January, Dumford was ordered to Islamwana, as was a small detachment of No. 5 Field Company, Royal Engineers, commanded by Lieutenant John Chard, which had arrived on the 19th of January to repair the pontoons that crossed the Buffalo River. Chard rode ahead of his detachment to Islamwana on the morning of the 22nd of January to clarify his orders, but was sent back to Rourke's Drift with only his wagon and its driver to construct defensive positions for the expected reinforcement company, passing Dunford's column en route to the opposite direction. Sometime around noon on the 22nd, Major Spaulding left the station at Helpnica to ascertain the whereabouts of Rainforth's G Company, which was now overdue. He left Chard in temporary command. Chard rode down to the drift itself where the engineers camp was located. A short while later, two survivors from Islamwana, the tenant of the first third native Natal contingent and a trooper from the Natal cabineers arrived bearing the news of the defeat and that part of the Zulu MP was approaching the station. Upon hearing this, Chard Bromhead and another of the station's officers Acting Assistant Commissary James Dalton of the Commissariat and Transport Department held a quick meeting to decide the best course of action, whether to retreat to help Makar or defend their current position. Dalton said that a small column traveling in open country with carts full of hospital patients would be easily overtaken and defeated by the numerically superior Zulu force. So it was agreed that the only acceptable course was to remain and fight. Once the officers had decided to stay, Chard and Bromhead directed their men to make preparations to defend the station. With the garrison's men working quickly, 
and a defensive perimeter was constructed out of mealy bags. This perimeter included the storehouse, the hospital, and a stout stone kraal. The buildings were fortified with firing holes, knocked through the external walls, and the external doors barricaded with furniture. At about 3.30 p.m., a mixed troop of about 100 Natal native horse with Lieutenant Alfred Henderson arrived at the station after having retreated from Islamwana. They volunteered to picket the far side of the Oscarburg, Cheyenne, and the large hill that overlooked the station and from behind which the Zulus were expected to approach. With the defences nearing completion and the battle approaching, Chad had several hundred men available to him. Bromhead's B Company, Stephen's Large Natal Native Contingent Company. Henderson's Natal Native Horse Troop and various others, most of them hospital patients, but walking wounded, drawn from various British and colonial units. Ardendorf also stayed, while the trooper who had ridden in with him galloped on to warn the garrison at helped Makar. The force was sufficient, in Chard's estimation, to fend off the Zulus. Chard posted the British soldiers around the perimeter, and in some of the more able patients, the casuals, and civilians and those of the Natal native contingent who possessed firearms along the barricade. The rest of the Natal native contingent, armed only with spears, was posted outside the mealy bag and biscuit box barricade within the stone walled cattle corral. The approaching Zulu force was vastly larger. The regiments were of married men aged in their 30s and 40s and the young unmarried men mustered about 3,000 to 4,000 warriors. None of them were involved in the battle at Islamwana. The Zulu force was the loins or reserve of the army at Islamwana, and it is often referred to as the Undi Corps. It was directed to swing wide of the British left flank and pass west and south to of Islamwana Hill itself, in order to position itself across the line of communication and retreat of the British and their colonial allies in order to prevent their escape back into Natal by way of the Buffalo River Ford, leading to Rock's Drift. By the time the Undi Corps reached Rock's Drift at 4.30, they had fast marched some 20 miles from the morning encampment they had left at around 8 a.m. and they would spend almost the next 11 and a half hours continuously storming the British fortifications at Rock Drift. Most Zulu warriors were armed with an assegai or short spear and a shield made of cowhide. The Zulu army drilled in personal and tactical use and coordination of this weapon. Some Zulus also had old muskets and rifles but their marksmanship training was poor and the quality and the supply of powder and shot was dreadful. The Zulu attitude towards the firearms was that the Zulu warriors would not have firearms. The arms were that of a coward, as they said, and that they would enable the patroon to kill the brave without awaiting his attack. Even though their fire was not accurate, it was responsible for five of the 17 British deaths at Rock's Drift. While the Undi Corps had been led by one of the Zulu chieftains at Islamwana battle, the command then went to the half-brother of the king, Ketsueyo, when the commander at Islamwana was wounded during the pursuit of British fugitives from Islamwana. Prince Dabulumanzi, was considered rash and aggressive. And the capturation was borne out by the violation of King Ketchewaya's order to act only in defence of Zuluand against the invading British soldiers and not carry the war to the border and into enemy territory. The Rock's Drift attack was an unplanned raid rather than any organised counter-invasion with many of the Undi Corps Zulus breaking off 
to raid other African kraals and homesteads while the main body advanced to Rock's Drift. About 4 p.m., Surgeon James Reynolds, Otto Witt, the Swedish missionary who ran the mission at Rock's Drift, and Army Chaplain Reverend George Smith came down from the Oskarberg hillside with the news that the body of Zulus was crossing the river and was no more than five minutes away. At this point, Witt decided to depart the station with his family uh, lived in an isolated farmhouse about 30 kilometers or 19 miles away and he wanted to be with them. Witt's native servant left with him. So too did one of the hospital patients, Lieutenant Thomas Purvis of the 1st, 3rd Natal native contingent. About 4.20 p.m. The battle began with Lieutenant Henderson's Natal native horse troopers stationed behind the Osterberg, briefly engaging the vanguard of the main Zulu force. However, tired from the battle of Islamwana and retreat to Rock's Drift, as well as being short on carbine ammunition, Henderson's men departed for help the car. Henderson himself informed Lieutenant Chard that the enemy was close and that his men would not obey his orders, but were going off to help Makar. Henderson then followed his departing men upon witnessing the withdrawal of Henderson's Natal native force troop. Captain Stevenson's Natal native contingent company abandoned the cattle kraal and fled, greatly reducing the strength of the defending garrison. Outraged at Stevenson, and some of his colonial non-commissioned officers also fled from the barricades. A few British soldiers fired after them, killing Corporal William Anderson. With the Zulus nearly at the station, the garrison now numbered between 154 and 156 men. Of these, only Bromhead's company could be considered a cohesive unit. Additionally, up to 39 of his company were in the station as hospital patients, although only a handful of these were unable to take up arms. With fewer men, Chard realised and needed to modify the defences and gave orders that biscuit boxes to be used to construct a wall through the middle of the post in order to make possible the abandonment of the hospital side of the station if the need arose. At 4.30pm, the Zulus rounded the Oskarberg and approached the South Wall. Private Frederick Hitch, posted as lookout on top of the storehouse, reported a large column of Zulus approaching. The Zulu vanguard, 600 men, attacked the wall south, which joined the hospital and the stone house. The British opened fire and the Zulus were 500 yards, 460 metres away. The majority of the attacking Zulu force swept around the attack to the North Wall, while a few took cover and there were other pinned down by continued British fire or retreated to the terraces of the Oskarberg. There they began to harassing fire of their own. As this occurred, another Zulu force swept on to the hospital from the northwestern wall. Those British on the barricades included Dalton and Bromhead were soon engaged in fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The British wall was too high for the Zulus to scale, so they resorted to crouching under the wall, trying to get hold of the defenders' Martini Henry rifles, slashing at British soldiers with assegais or firing their weapons through the wall. At places, they clambered over each other's bodies to drive the British off the wall, but they were driven back. Zulu fire, both from those under the wall and around the Osterberg, inflicted a few casualties. And five of the 17 defenders who were killed or mortally wounded in the action were struck while at the North Wall. Chard realised that the North Wall, under the near constant Zulu attack, could not be held. At 6pm, he pulled his men back 
into the yard, abandoning two front rooms of the hospital in the process. The hospital was becoming hard to defend and the loopholes had become a liability. Rifles poking out were grabbed by the Zulus. Yet if the holes were left empty, the Zulu warriors stuck their own weapons through in order to fire into the rooms. Among the soldiers assigned to the hospital were Corporal William Wilson Allen and Privates Cole, Dunbar, Hitch, Oregon, John Williams, Joseph Williams, Alfred Henry Hook, Robert Jones and William Jones. Privates Oregon, John Williams, Joseph Williams and other patients tried to hold the hospital entrance with rifles and fixed bayonets. Joseph Williams defended a small window and 14 dead Zulus were later found beneath that window. It had become clear the front of the building was being taken over by Zulus. John Williams began to hack a way to escape through the wall dividing the central room and the corner room at the back of the hospital. As he made a passable breach, the door into the central room came under furious attack from the Zulus and he only had one time to drag two bedridden patients out before the door gave way. The corner room that John Williams had pulled the two patients into was occupied by Private Hook and nine patients. John Williams hacked at the wall to the next room with his pickaxe as Hook held off the Zulus. A firefight erupted as the Zulus fired through the door and Hook returned fire, but not without an Asagai striking his helmet and stunning him. Williams made the hole big enough to get them to the next room, which was occupied only by patient Private Walters and dragged the patients through. The last man out was Hook, who killed some Zulus who had tried to knock down the door before he dived through the hole. John Williams once again went to work, spurred on by the fact that the roof was now ablaze, as Hook defended the hole and Walters continued to fire through the loophole. After 50 minutes, the hole was large enough to drag the patients through. And the men, apart from Privates Waters and Beckett, who hid in the wardrobe, Waters was wounded and Beckett died of Asagai wounds. They were now in the last room, being defended by Privates Robert Jones and William Jones. From here, the patients clambered out through the window and made their way across to the yard to the barricade. Of 11 patients, nine survived the trip to the barricade, as did all the able-bodied men. According to James Henry Reynolds, only four defenders were killed in the hospital. One was a member of the Natal native contingent with a broken leg. Sergeant Max Field and Private Jenkins who were ill with fever and refused to be moved, were also killed. Reportedly, Jenkins was killed after being seized and stabbed, together with Private Adams. Private Cole, assigned to the hospital, was killed when he ran outside. Another hospital patient killed Trooper Hunter of the Natal Mounted Police. Among the hospital patients who escaped were a Corporal Mayor of the Natal Native Contingent, Bombardier Lewis of the Royal Artillery, and Trooper Green of the Natal Mounted Police, who was wounded in the thigh by a bullet. Private Connolly, with a broken leg, was pulled to safety by Hook, though Connolly's leg was broken again in the process. Private Connolly, with a broken leg, was pulled to safety by Hook, although Connolly's leg was broken again in the process. As night fell, the Zulu attacks grew stronger. The cattle kraal came under renewed assault and was evacuated by 10 p.m., leaving the remaining men in the small bastion around the storehouse. 
throughout the night the zulu kept up a constant assault against the british positions zulu attacks only began to slacken after midnight and they finally ended by 2 a.m being replaced by a constant harassing of the of zulu firearms until 4 a.m by that time the garrison had suffered 14 dead two others were mortally wounded and eight more including dalton were seriously wounded most every man had some kind of wound they were all exhausted having fought for the better part of 10 hours and were running low on ammunition of 20,000 rounds in reserve at the mission only 900 rounds were left as dawn broke the british could see that the zulus were gone all that remained were the dead and severely wounded at about 7 a.m an mp of zulus suddenly appeared and the british manned the positions again no attack took place as the zulus had been on the move for six days prior to the battle and had not eaten properly for two in their ranks were hundreds of wounded and they were several days march from any supplies soon after their appearance the zulus left the way they had come three of the men who fought at rook's drift are buried in swansea they are 963 private david lewis james owen of b company second battalion 24th regiment 841 private david jenkins first battalion 24th regiment 906 private john connolly c company second battalion 24th regiment all survived the battle private david lewis was born in swansea and worked as a tin worker his name was james owen but used the alias david lewis on joining the british army it was not unusual for men to give false names when joining the army he was posted to second battalion the 24th foot in 1877 in 1879, when he left the army, an injury assessment board held at the Royal Hospital Chelsea confirmed he was suffering from valvular disease of the heart due to being under canvas for months and constantly exposed to climatic vivisitudes. Whilst in the army, he was known to read letters from home to the men who could not read themselves and to write their replies in what was described as his beautiful handwriting. He died in Swansea aged 87 in 1938 while living with his son in Campbell Street, Bryn Mill. His grave is in Bethel Cemetery in the city's Sketty area. Private David Jenkins was born in Devonog near Brecon in 1846 and enlisted for the town's 25th Brigade at the age of 28, being posted to South Africa in 1874. From 1882, he served with the South Wales Borderers, becoming Lance Corporal the following year. He was responsible for saving the life of Lieutenant John Chard, the commanding officer at Rourke's Drift, by ducking his head down to miss a bullet. Private Jenkins had not been on the original role as having served at Rourke's Drift, but his family found evidence to say he was there and his name was then included. He was discharged in 1888 and settled in Swansea, where he became a storekeeper in the city's docks. On a royal visit to Swansea in 1904, he was introduced to King Edward VII. David Jenkins died in 1912 and is buried in Cumgetley Cemetery, Treborth, Swansea. Last but by no means least is Private John Connolly, born in Castletown, Bearhaven, County Cork, Ireland in 1859. His final resting place is an unmarked pauper's grave at Danagraig Cemetery, Swansea, Section A, Grave 458. Private John Connolly was a patient in the hospital at Rourke's Drift when the battle started, recovering from a dislocated knee caused when he slipped, loading a wagon at Tugela River. The accident left him hanging downwards between the outside rails, thus dislocating his knee. Private Hook VC was guarding the hospital and rescued Connolly by dragging him behind him, escaping through a hole made in the hospital wall and then carrying him on his back to safety. Unfortunately for Private Connolly, his knee was again dislocated in the process. Private Hook said, Watching my chance, I dashed from the doorway, and grabbing Connolly, I pulled him after me through the hole. His leg got broken again, but there was no help for it. As soon as we left the room, the Zulus were in there with furious cries of disappointment and rage. 
Now there was a repetition of the work. Again, I had to drag Connolly through a terrible task because he was a very heavy man. Alphonse de Neuville's painting of the battle, based on eyewitness accounts, depicts several events occurring at once, including Private Henry Hook VC carrying Private John Connolly on his back away from the burning hospital. When John Connolly left the army, he moved to Swansea and married Kathleen Crowley at Swansea, September 1885. The 1901 census for Swansea shows him living with his wife, Catherine Connolly, Nee Crowley, their four children all living at 35 Llangevelach Street, Swansea. A 1906 newspaper reporting on the death of John Connolly said, Poor Connolly was invalided home with a broken knee, and death has only now released him from almost constant suffering since that time. Rheumatic fever set in, complications ensued, and dropsy ended him. When our reporter visited him, he found the sufferer full of his old-time grit. The sunlight streamed through the little window across the bed on which he lay. John Connolly said in humorous sadness, If the world frowns on me, the sun shines. Private John Connolly was buried in an unmarked pauper's grave, but with full military honours at 3pm on Saturday the 10th of November 1906. His grave at Danagraig Cemetery is today still unmarked. Like his fellow soldiers, Pope Connolly defended Rorkstrift with great courage and should not be forgotten.